Social Darwinism is a nefarious and outdated theory condemned both by people of faith as well as evolutionists. I think that some of that is true, but it's a position that I think reflects postmodern uh, cynicism. The American Religious Town Hall is now in session. Welcome, friends, to the American Religious Town Hall Meeting, where the discussion of religious, political, and social issues is meant to promote the cause of religious freedom and to help us better understand each other. And now, here is your host and moderator. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for uh, another interesting show. Uh, my name is Andrea Luxton. I'm today's moderator, and I would like you to meet our panel. Hi, I am Tom Plumley. I'm the senior minister at First Christian Church in Fort Worth, Texas. We're a part of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. My name is Mel Robeck. I'm senior professor of church history and ecumenics and special assistant to the president for ecumenical relations at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. I am also an Assemblies of God minister. Hi, I'm Carl Troval. I'm professor of ethics and history at Concordia University in Austin, Texas. My name is Bishop Michael Olson, and I serve as the Bishop of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Fort Worth, Texas. And now for today's program. In The Descent of Man, Charles Darwin writes, Man scans the pedigree of his horses, cattle, and dogs before he matches them. But when it comes to his own marriage, he rarely or never takes any such care. Some people believe it's time we pick our marriage partners for their intellectual and physical value or what they bring to the relationship. So much for true love. <laughs> Sound crazy? This position is not some neo-Nazi nationalism. It's more subtle than that. Many now believe in a new form of social Darwinism bent on creating stronger humans and therefore a stronger society. They believe our very survivability depends on breeding out weakness and the diseased, supporting the strong, and encouraging the development of a more advanced society. True love takes a back seat to pure economic viability. So we are asking our panelists to weigh in on this issue and answer the following questions. Number one, was biblical Israel, and for that matter, the United States of America, set apart to be a light unto the world? Or is it to our manifest destiny to become so strong we either absorb or conquer those around us? Secondly, how do we perpetuate true love when our altruism may cost us more personally as we care for, quote, the least of these in our society? Thirdly, recent polls reveal 58% of Americans, uh, Republicans have risen to 77%, <coughs> believe COVID was created from a lab in China. How do we cope with those who now believe COVID was an intentional strategic plan created to weed out the weakest among us? We'll start by going back to those who began our program. Carl. Sure, thanks. Well, first of all, I just want to be really clear that I don't think that the United States was created to be some um, uh, light uh, of the world, even from that Christian interpretation that to go from <coughs> sea to shining sea. I just want to just soundly condemn that. I think we're one nation among many who had specific historical reasons, but it isn't like God chose us or anything. Um, secondly, I also I want to be clear that I do not think that COVID is some international strategic plan. Uh, at, at worst, it was an accident uh, uh, in a Chinese lab at, uh, I don't know if there's a best to it, but it, nevertheless, it's here and we have to deal with it. But I want to go back to the social Darwinism argument because social Darwinism uh, really was a loose set of ideologies that began in the late 1800s. Uh, and it was used to justify the cultural trends of the time. And it was basically you know, something that Darwin 
uh, uh, never really addressed. He's interested in individual uh, evolution of species. And, uh, but it was used by those who were in cultural power to justify their power uh, and their wealth uh, at a time when people wanted to dominate over other people. I mean, it was a time of manifest destiny still. Uh, I can still hear arguments about how certain groups of people, namely in, in my historic, when I teach history of Mexico, history and culture of Mexican American, how Americans considered uh, themselves uh, rightful inheritors of the land that Mexico had because they could manage the land better and they, that, and they were inherently better than any Mexican was. And so, uh, and these social Darwinist theories that suggested that certain people are better genetically than other people uh, gave them justification for doing it. Well, see, that's just the way it is. That's the way God made it. And uh, the way Darwin um, evolution would suggest survival of the fittest. But it justified imperialism of the United States against other nations. It justified our racism. Because once you have now uh, slavery is outlawed, now you have to figure out some way to somehow say that the, the white man is uh, superior genetically to uh, a brown or black man or woman. Uh, you have uh, eugenics trying to eliminate certain people. You have social inequality that's justified. Laissez-faire capitalism was justified as well. The American economist William Graham Sumner opposed the welfare state and said, well, he said, social Darwinism is the way that that happens, you know, that you have to eliminate the people who are the poorest among you. And obviously the people who have the wealth obviously worked harder for it. So this is a part of the evolution of society. Uh, and of course, Nazi Germany also used social Darwinist principles to justify the elimination of the Jews and other uh, deplorables uh, in, in their society, like uh, in gay people, the gypsies, uh, or the Romani, the, uh, um, um, as well as as uh, others, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. The point here is that strictly on the basis of evolution, evolutionary theory actually says that we've evolved to be socially cooperative, and it's in our best interest to be socially cooperative, not to eliminate and divide one another. And uh, so I think even on a scientific basis, scientists would say, no, 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 no. This is about individual survival, but in terms of collective survival, we actually have to turn to one another and help one another to survive as a species. There has to be cooperation, and we've evolved that way. And that's speaking strictly from a, a evolutionist uh, perspective and uh, but I, I think people of faith, and by the way, I don't mean to suggest that people of faith are not evolutionists, because, I mean, I certainly believe that God used evolution as a method by bringing us to where we are, but I don't think that those are in contradiction with one another, because the clear word of God suggests that it's our obligation to care for those who are the most vulnerable, the poor, the widow, the orphan, uh, to use those metaphors uh, for the vulnerable and marginalized. So. I just want to soundly condemn social Darwinism as a theory and why anyone's bringing it up again. I don't know, but it's soundly condemned by both Christian tradition as well as, as by science and evolutionists themselves. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, wow. I, I, I agree with uh, all of that. You know, it's, a, <laughs> it's really surprising that it would come up, uh, but it does, it recurs, you know. And, I mean, even as I sat just... Uh, recently and watched uh, Rand Paul and Dr. Fauci face off with one another, you know, and this claim that, you know, Dr. Fauci, you've been lying to us uh, because it really did come from this and you've said so yourself, but now you're denying it. And, you know, uh, I just, I find that absolutely impossible to understand or appreciate or accept. I mean, it's a conspiracy theory, you know, and I think it's based on cynicism about medical science at this particular point in time, and I think it's very dif difficult to uh, justify. You know, it, a lot of this went on in the 19th century. You know, Dar it, that was the, the late 19th century was the period of, of Darwin. You know, everybody was celebrating Darwin. Everybody, all the major universities, although... Um, uh, Britain was slower than America was to, to celebrate him. Uh, I, w I was really surprised to realize that, but it was at least a 20-year gap between the time the U.S. said, oh, this is the direction we need to go and we need to embrace this, and uh, that Britain came. But there were other groups that, uh, that got involved in social Darwinism, and, and I would say the free love groups in particular, the spiritualists and those people who were arguing for free love. M by that they meant um, in a sense, women's liberation. Women have the right to choose whether to love or not to love. It's not up to the man, it's always up to the woman. And so they develop societies like the Amana Society, the United Society, and so forth, to, to try to uh, figure this out. And then they, then they uh, took uh, certain men and certain women and, and they tried to 
mate them to produce new uh, progenitors and so forth. You could look at, in a sense, I suppose you could look at certain kinds of these radically fundamentalist polygamist uh, Mormon groups that do much the same way by um, uh, filtering it down and then kicking the younger men out that don't fit or aren't going to be the successors to the, the whole thing. I, I think it's a, it's a human foible, if you would, uh, and it does have to do a great deal with power as over against uh, the realities of what we face. And I agree with you about God's ability and desire and even use of um, evolutionary uh, reality to bring us to where we are. I, mean, I don't know, I mean, in the end, I want to say God created, right. okay? But he can use any, any ways he wants to do that. Tom? Yeah, I, I just want to say poor Charles Dar Darwin for, for, for getting his, his name dragged through the muck yeah. of so much human sin yeah. uh, and greed yeah. and uh, 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 desire to oppress and, 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 and those, those kinds of things. Uh, uh, as as uh, Carl said, you know what, what he what he was really talking about was that we are not only evolving toward cooperation, but ev evolving toward toward mutual caring and and responsibility for each other. Um, and so, so, gosh, the the poor guy. Um, uh, I I, I want to go back though to our to our uh, what I call our marching orders as the body of Christ. Uh, uh, all of us uh, are ha have before us uh, uh, Jesus's uh, initial understanding of who he was and what he was about, set out in his first sermon. Uh, and I think if we are the body of Christ, we are to do that. We are to be about good news for the weak, good news for the poor recovery of sight for the blind, setting at liberty those who are oppressed, uh, bringing in God, or declaring God's uh, jubilee time, uh, the, the time, the time of, of redistribution and, and of emancipation uh, uh, that, that, that God had, had designed. Uh, that's what we're about. Uh, that's what Jesus was about. Uh, bearing the weak um, and 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 bringing each other up to a higher standard and to a higher uh, 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 ability to take care of ourselves. Yeah. Bishop, anything to add? Uh, y yes, I would just say um, uh, Malthus is really who comes to mind in the oh, yeah. 19th century as far as, I mean, social Darwinism, it wasn't Darwin, I know, but they they took a certain aspect of the theory and they said, hey, you know, this can justify the way we've been treating people for a while. <laughs> right, right. There you All go. right, so in the, in the, in the, in, and science. In England as well, you know, you had the Irish potato famine prior to that, and then they justify it this way. Well, you know, they're Irish. And then, you know, and then in the United States, same thing with, with the kind of a theological bent towards manifest destiny, et cetera. Um, but also, I mean, in the Industrial Revolution, um, there, there was a need for, um, we needed workers, not families, but families were needed to somehow form workers, but you didn't want an agrarian family, so we developed this nuclear family idea, presided that you, they'd be workers in the industrial cog, or sailors in an empire's navy, you know? And so those are all, those are all convenient uses of theories for application, which, which really aren't based in an observation of reality. It's not empirical science as well. And so it takes on an ideological agenda. Where I see it not quite as strong today, but, uh, but, but where, where it's been with regard to the COVID crisis, I, I find is a lot of people are saying, well, you know, most of those people who died anyway had other pre-existing conditions. So, you know, we all gotta go sometime. So therefore, why should I wear a mask, you know, for that? And that's really, I mean, it, when, you, when you boil right down to that's where it, 
that's that's what it is is I just don't want to care about it and let them take care of themselves or yeah. get out of the way uh, but you know this Most is important get out of the way well yes yeah. and it, that seems to be you know but but that's our approach of vulnerable I think is a society in general and we use science for our ideological bent all the time uh, you know I think you know the, the there's a you know the the um, the the the, uh, cell, the 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 prenatal test for Down syndrome, all right, that's done in an embryo. Well, why are we doing that? Is it going to help us treat Down syndrome? Or is it going to? Well, no, they do it in the sense to encourage the abortion of of a Down syndrome child, you know, because well, there's too many of them, and what, how are they going to fit in? And then we start weeding other people out. All right, and, and it's it's a subtle, you know, you know, Nazi Germany forced this because it's you know by way of will and, you know, I think we're a little more seductive than the Nazis, but I'm not so sure how different we are all the time, when it comes to our values about who belongs and who doesn't belong, and then it's an extra scandal, and sacrilege when we somehow apply this to God's will. You know that that God thinks it where where somehow it's that God directs us for entitlement in the exceptionalism of entitlement instead of the exceptionalism of service. As a country, you know, we all got here, I know, save the Indians, but one could maybe, you know, make an argument for Native Americans being, being pushed out by other tribes, etc. But all of us somehow got here, and of course I know the African Americans as well, but even there, though, you had tribes selling other tribes. You know, it's, but the United States, we escaped from some sort of bad situation that made our ancestors somehow decide we're going to cross an ocean to get over here because we need to survive. And then we need to live, and then we forget that base, basis, and uh, it turns us into... Um, uh, you know, committing the same sort of evil that got us here in the first place. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Particu particularly against those folk who were who were living here That's already. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, as you were talking, it occurred to me too. I, I also think that the social Darwinism was a convenient way for religious people. Maybe you said that, but I, maybe, and so I'm just repeating. But it's a convenient way for religious people to say, well, now there's objective evidence that our oppression was uh, fine. I mean, like, I can't justify it on my Christian principles. But, I mean, since that's the way the science works, I mean, who am I to say it isn't? So, right? So you can shift blame away from yourselves and your oppression of other people to, well, this is the way of science. Yeah. Is there hope we can do it another way? Or is this just how we are? Is this just a... Uh... How it oh, is. I, well, I think deeply we, as fundamentally uh, uh, both saint and sinner, I think the sinner side of us will continue to oppress people and seek advantages for ourselves. I mean, I think this is why precisely I, I'm Christian, is because um, I, I hope that the, 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 the better angel of my nature and, the, I mean, that God's transformation of myself can help uh, transform that selfish part of me, uh, forgive it, but then transform me into something that's other oriented rather than self oriented. And I, I, that, I think that that's. Well, that's I think the fact that we're prone to something doesn't mean we're fated to something. Yeah, good yeah. point. All right. Yeah. And, I, and I think for, as a Christian, I think that relies on God's grace. Yeah. All right. As, in the way God wants to give it, both in ordinary ways and extraordinary ways. And, and us teaching the story. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The story our, of how we can be different. Yeah, but our nature certainly makes sure that it uh, rears its ugly head again and again and again. It often takes different forms, but at the same time, it's, it's the same old story. All right, thank you. Let's have a break. We hope you're enjoying today's program. If you'd like to learn more about the American Religious Town Hall, please visit our website at AmericanReligious.org. That's AmericanReligious.org. There you can read about the vision and history of the program, and we invite you to become a ministry partner, explore our Town Hall Estates healthcare facilities, and view past programs by clicking the appropriate menu buttons. Each week, we look forward to receiving your letters. You may write us at the address shown on your screen. Send your letters to American Religious Town Hall Meeting, P. 
P.O. Box 180118, Dallas, Texas, 75218. If you have a prayer request, please send it to prayerrequest at americanreligious.org. Thank you for writing and thank you for watching. Now, back to today's closing statements. Welcome back, and please do take the invitation seriously. We, we do love to hear from you. Um, we like to hear your comments, your, your questions, your suggestions, and your requests for prayer. So please keep in contact with us. We're now going into our concluding uh, arguments. Thank you. I'm not sure it's an argument. Uh, I, I, I would simply say, <laughs> the, <laughs> yeah, I, I would sim simply say, uh, in conclusion, that um, uh, we need to examine ourselves uh, because this is a, this is a tendency. What we've been talking about uh, is a tendency that that uh, uh, that all of us have and and need to need to uh, fight against. Uh, and a good way to think about it is this. Uh, Any time I think less of one person's death than I do of another's, uh, then I am part of this sort of problem. Any time uh, I feel myself saying, well, that person that was shot in that neighborhood that's just to be expected. Or that person died of this COVID disease because of something that they already had and were going down the road toward death anyway. And, and, and reduce that death to anything less than the grievous uh, uh, thing that it, that it was. Uh, then I am part of the problem. So, so if, we can, if we can watch ourselves in that way, I think we might be able to turn a corner and go a different direction. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, thanks, Tom. I appreciate that. I completely agree with that. And um, I, I, you mentioned COVID. I mean, I don't think the one thing that we've talked a whole lot about, but uh, the consequences for those... Uh, who are poor, uh, who are more marginalized, who don't have access to health care. This COVID crisis is certainly hitting them way harder than those of us sitting at this table. Um, and I mean, I'm making a presumption as a generalization, really, uh, about our wealth and status and society uh, and position. And I think that that alone makes me think, you know, this isn't a time to sit back and say, well, that's just really so sad. I think it's about how do we encourage uh, ourselves to be more responsible. I mean, I hate wearing masks like everyone else does. I mean, I think everyone hates wearing the mask. So then the question is, well, what can, what's within our realm of control to help contain the virus and its spread so that it doesn't affect the people who are most affected? And I mean, we know that people in poor communities are more deeply affected, and there are lots of complicated reasons for that. But I do hope that we'd be transformed ourselves in a way of taking that personal responsibility and saying, what is it I can do to not for everyone else, um, and not blame. Mm -hmm. I'd just uh, like to close, I guess, uh, encapsulate the statement, uh, my statement with uh, just quoting what Pope Francis said uh, to the United States Congress when he visited in 2015, just to cite something here. The golden rule points us in a clear direction. Let us treat others with the same passion and compassion with which we want to be treated. Let us seek for others the same possibilities which we seek for ourselves. Let us help others to grow as we would like to be helped ourselves. In a word, if we want security, let us give security. If we want life, let us give life. If we want opportunities, let us provide opportunities. The yardstick we use for others will be the yardstick which time will use for us. The golden rule also reminds us of our responsibility to protect and defend human life at every stage of its development. Very good. I don't think these ideas are simply Charles Darwin's ideas. I think when I think of this, I think of Jack London as well. Uh, he was very much in, in this particular fit of mind. And I think that, you know, as we thought about uh, the, the way we get married uh, or the way we seek a mate, it's, it's really interesting to me 
that uh, kind of this uh, Darwinian approach or Jack London approach or whatever might be something like this. I've made a lot of mistakes and one of those was marrying my wife or she marrying me, you know, because I never did go back and ask her first, uh, tell me about your ancestry. Give me a, your genetic <laughs> markers. Let me, let me find out what your strengths and weaknesses are. Uh, do you have a medical or physical uh, uh, history that you can give to me so that I can make a decision that's useful? You know, my wife has genetic heart issues, you know. She has uh, uh, precancerous kinds of issues, you know. They, these are, you know, uh, uh, let me see your teeth, you know. I mean, don't, don't, don't they do that with horses, you know? Like, let me see, let me see that, yeah, that's what they do. Um, I just think that that's kind of crazy. Uh, <laughs> just a little bit, and I know that if my wife had done that to me, I would have failed miserably, you know? Uh, so uh, I just have to say, viva l'amour, you know? Uh, love, <laughs> let love take its place. And for those of us who believe that God, God guides our footsteps, I think God brings people into our paths, and we are ultimately the one that makes a choice. It's not pre-programmed, we're not told this is who you must marry or anything like that, but I do think that God's in the mix and I think I, I am quite happy to trust that. And my heart. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all very much. A, a very engaging conversation. Um, as I was listening to the concluding statements, um, reminded me of John Donne, my favorite writer, no man is a, an island in time himself. And just the whole concept of, of of we are part of the whole, and when the bell tolls for one person, yeah, it actually tolls for all of us. Uh, we are all a losers when someone else loses. The Charter of the American Religious Town Hall provides that Roman Catholics, Protestant Jews, educators, and others may appear on this program and can declare their beliefs without hesitancy. And the rest of the members of the panel will uphold and guarantee that American right to all who will appear irrespective of race or creed, so that the rest of the world can see that here in America, we believe in civil and religious freedom, not only in theory, but in reality. And now, friends, until next week, at the same time and over the very same channel, the American Religious Town Hall meeting stands adjourned. And may the God of all of us bless all of you.